Okay, well, thank you everyone and welcome to this uh, next edition of VMAX. Uh, I'm gonna be the host for today, but just a quick reminder of the ground rules. Uh, everyone's audio and video is going to be muted. Uh, your video cannot be turned on at any time, either by you uh, or by us. Uh, and during the Q&A session at the end, uh, if you would like to ask a question, you'll have the ability to raise your hand, which you can do at the bottom using the, the participant function. Uh, and then we will give you the ability to unmute yourself, but we'll never unmute your mic uh, without your, your prior consent. We'd ask that during the talk, uh, if you have clarifying questions, you can put them in using the Q&A feature, uh, but please don't use the, the chat feature unless you wanna bring up some technical or, or other difficulties that may be going on. So put questions into the, the Q&A part. Also one, one final announcement, uh, like we talked about last time, we're gonna have a version of VMAX in July. This can be more oriented toward uh, junior researchers. And so if you'd like to be an organizer for that, uh, go to our website or click the link in the chat uh, and submit your name. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. So Adrian Eau Claire is going to be presenting uh, and his co-authors are also here to answer your questions in the Q&A, uh, Hannes Malmberg, Frederic Martinet, and Matt Rongley. So Adrian, take it away. Thanks so much, Kurt. So uh, before we begin, let me just take a minute to thank uh, the organizers for putting together VMAX. So Claudia, Laura, Stefania, Kurt, Ralph, and Morten. I've benefited a ton from the ability to watch the seminars either live or on the YouTube channel. Um, and you guys have really made the pandemic a lot better than it would otherwise have been. Um, so uh, I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot from the presentation so far, uh, and I'm hoping that you guys will learn something from this presentation too. Yeah. So as the title suggests, we're gonna take a step back from current macro developments in this paper to think about long run trends. Uh, so we're motivated in a set of trends uh, that have occurred uh, over the past 70 years or so, uh, and the extent to which these trends are likely to continue uh, in the rest of the 21st century. The paper is joined with Hannes, as Kurt mentioned, uh, Frederick Martinet, who's a fantastic student of mine at Stanford, and Matt Rogley, who's my longtime co-author. Um, and they're all available in the Q&A to answer your questions, and they'll be there uh, at the end as well. Yeah. So what are those trends? Well, they're well-documented trends. So the first one is that the world population is aging. Uh, so this graph shows you uh, the share of the population age 50 or above in five major economies uh, that represent together 50% uh, of world GDP today. Uh, so the solid lines are what's happened until now, and the dashed lines are our population projections for the rest of the 21st century. Uh, so you, what you can see is that the world's population has been aging everywhere, um, but also that the pace has been uneven. Uh, and in particular, while the aging transition is mostly over in Japan, um, it still has a long way to go in China and especially in India. So meanwhile, um, what we've seen is a well-documented increase in wealth to GDP ratios. Right? Uh, so, so this graph shows you private wealth over GDP uh, for the five countries that I've, I've just shown you. And um, the, the, those ratios uh, have increased by around 100% of GDP or more uh, in those five countries. And this is a trend that's happened around the world. Um, at the same time, uh, we've seen decline in real interest rates. Um, and uh, this has been a notable concern to policymakers who are um, worried about hitting the zero lower bound in the future or continuing uh, for it to, be, to continue to be an issue. Um, the exact magnitude of the decline in real interest rates, of course, look, depends exactly on which measure you look at um, and what measure of return. Um, but, um, but, but this is a general trend. Um, and the final uh, trend that we're interested in, in is the so-called rise in global imbalances. Uh, measured here as the net international investment position of countries. Um, and again, since the 1990s, a well-documented trend is the US has been running a large current account deficit that's accumulated to a very large negative international investment position, uh, while Germany, uh, China, and Japan have accumulated large assets abroad. So what we're interested in in this paper is the causal link uh, between aging uh, and those other macro trends, the wealth to output ratio, real interest rates and capital flows. And for concreteness, what we're going to ask is the following question. So suppose uh, that all that changes from now on is uh, the aging of the uh, population um, as given by population projections. What is our best forecast of those macro trends uh, over the rest of the 21st century? 
So of course, we're not the first uh, to ask this type of question. Uh, what we're bringing to the table is a new method that we think um, helps discipline this exercise and uh, sheds light on the economics of uh, aging. Um, and the way we'll discipline it is using a particular shift chair. Right? So think that if you want to forecast from today, uh, the wealth to GDP ratio, T periods from now, T years from now. So our shift chair works as follows. So you take today's assets and labor income profile by age, and then you compute the average wealth as if the population was the projected population distribution T years from now, uh, but you're, you're using current asset profiles and you're doing the same for labor income. And then you take the ratio of the two that gives you our projected measure of W over Y, what we call the compositional effect of aging on the wealth to GDP ratio. So what I'm gonna show you today is how to use this shift chair exercise for general equilibrium counterfactuals. So I'm gonna focus on two types of counterfactuals. I'm gonna show you that there is an exact result where this corresponds to the transition dynamics of the wealth to GDP ratio in a particular case of a small open economy, so at constant interest rates. And then I'll show you in a second step that this can actually be used also approximately after you demean it in order to forecast net foreign asset positions, so global imbalances. So that's gonna be in the general case. Okay, so for concreteness, uh, here's our results. So let's take my measure of forecasted uh, wealth to GDP and normalize it so that it's zero in year zero. So we have two sets of findings. So one is on measurement. We're gonna show that this compositional effect of aging is positive, large and heterogeneous across countries, right? So by the end of the 21st century, we're measuring 85 percentage points in Germany and 305 percentage points in India. So why are they positive? That's because older individuals hold more wealth and earn less income. And as time passes, there is increasingly more old individuals that's creating a positive effect everywhere. Why are they large? Well, that's because older individuals hold a lot more wealth and earn a lot less income. And as the demographic uh, transition unfolds, there is increasingly more older individuals and, and, uh, and, um, and, and those numbers are large, right? So the, the, the demographic transition is itself large. Now, why are they heterogeneous? Well, that's because the timing of the aging transition is uneven across countries. That's the biggest difference. There's also cross-country differences uh, in asset profiles and uh, of, uh, assets, uh, asset profiles and labor income profiles. Uh, but the main reason is the uh, uneven timing of the aging transition. Our second set of results is quantitative. So we're going to show that in a class of quantitative general equilibrium overlapping generations models across a range of calibrations, this compositional effect of aging in fact closely approximates the transition for the wealth to GDP ratio in small open economies. And then in integrated world economies, if you match this measure country by country, you're led to forecast very large global imbalances by the end of the 21st century. So for, for concreteness, you know, the, our forecasts imply that the German net foreign asset position will essentially completely revert, uh, while India will go from being a negative debtor to being a very, very large creditor. On the other hand, the effects on interest rates and wealth to GDP ratios in this general equilibrium exercise where interest rates are just in a world equilibrium are more uncertain. And I'll talk through why that is. And so briefly, uh, we're relating uh, to a very large literature that has thought about these issues. Right? So there's a very big literature that is a quantitative general equilibrium overlapping generations literature that has thought about causal effects of demographics on wealth, interest rates, and capital flows. And what we're bringing to the table for that literature is an important moment, the shift chair, uh, that drives kind of factuals in all of this literature and can be measured directly in the data. And separately, there is a shift chair approach to demographics that has uh, thought about specific components uh, of uh, demographic change, such as labor supply, productivity, participation, savings, and so on. Um, and for that literature, we're going to look at a shift chair 
that can actually be used uh, for general equilibrium counterfactuals. And so bridging the gap between this empirical literature and the more structural uh, overlapping generations literature. Okay. Now, of course, there's a very big literature on all the trends that we're talking about. And for that literature, we're isolating the specific role of demographics and showing you how to do forecasting at your size. Okay, so here's the outline for the talk. So the first thing I'll do is I'll present the H shift chair for W over Y, and then I'll show you the measurement exercise for the United States and then for 24 other countries. Then I'll turn to the specification of my model and I'll consider separately the small open economy case where I'll show you that the shift chair does a fairly good uh, job at matching the transition for the wealth to GDP ratio, um, as well as an exact result in which the, the, this, this particular shift chair works perfectly. Um, and then I'll look at an integrated world economy and talk about global imbalances. Okay, so let's get started. Here's the H shift chair for W over Y. So the, the H shift chair is extremely simple. Right? So let's consider a very general environment where you have an economy that produces output Y and is experiencing demographic change. We'll call the pop, so this is, we're, we're taking into account the H structure where uh, we'll call the population of HJ N J T and then total population is capital N. The first observation is that wealth can be broken down as the sum of individual wealth. And then that can further be broken down by the product of the number of individuals of HJ and AJT, which is the average wealth of individuals of HJ. We'll do the same for effective labor supply. So here there's a normalization involved, but let's call effective labor supply big L and say that's the weighted sum uh, of little H's where H's are effective, average effective labor units provided by individuals of HJ. Now suppose that in this economy, there's growth in labor productivity, Y over L. We're expecting for first, from first principles, AJT to scale with labor productivity. Intuitively, that's because labor productivity is determining wages and in turn, the wages are the source of savings over for individuals. So they'll uh, end up scaling uh, their wealth in proportion to the wages. So simply let's just denote little a as the ratio of average wealth uh, per individual by uh, productivity. And then we can rewrite wealth as the product of uh, labor productivity by the n weighted sum of little a's. Now, what that makes appear is the wealth to GDP ratio. Um, once I use my expression for labor input as a ratio of the n weighted sum of little a's, that's the H profile normalized by productivity, and the N weighted sum of little h's, that's the H profile of labor efficiency units. Right? And now that I'm here, it's very simple to just divide numerator and denominator by population in order to obtain an expression for the wealth to GDP ratio uh, that is a ratio of two weighted sums uh, where all the weights here are time varying. So, so far I haven't used any assumptions, you know, and that's because this holds exactly everywhere. Um, and this is just accounting. But what it shows is that a way to think about the wealth to GDP ratio moving over time uh, is as follows. You can think there's three reasons for changing W over Y. One is changing population shares, that's the pies. One is changing H profiles of productivity normalized assets. Those are the A's. Uh, and the final is changing H profiles of labor efficiency, uh, the H's. And ultimately you can always trace back uh, movements in wealth to GDP ratios uh, to one of these reasons. So what we're going to argue is that it's useful to fix the population weights, to fix the age profiles here and change the population weights. Right? So let's, uh, for any base here, define this measure, this shift chair measure delta comp, which is fixing the age profiles uh, at date zero, uh, just changing popula population shares. Uh, and then this is being normalized so that at date zero, uh, my delta comp measure is zero. So a simple observation is we can calculate this directly from data and population projections. There's a normalization involved. I'll talk about this in a second. Um, but just note that this is some object that's essentially a purely empirical object. Now, why is this a natural starting point for population projections? First of all, because it can be a sufficient statistic in a demographic transition. And I'm gonna show you an exact result in which this is true. This is going to be a special case of the small open economy in which endogenously, the little a's and the little h's will be constant. So in that case, we'll say that the economy is aging without what we call behavioral effects. Now in the general case, 
delta comp is still a component of the total change in, in the wealth to GDP ratio. So here I've written the total change in the wealth to GDP ratio, uh, where in the middle, I've put the wealth to GDP ratio just coming from the compositional effect. And so that gives you a simple natural sum where there is an effect that comes from the composition. And then there's an effect that comes from changing age profiles of assets and labor income. Uh, and I'll call these behavioral effects. So this particular decomposition provides us with a benchmark to evaluate transition dynamics in any general equilibrium model. And I'm gonna show you uh, that uh, the, the first term is always very, very large. Um, and it's, it, it's, um, it's useful to consider this as a benchmark uh, in that often the behavioral terms end up being small relative to the compositional effect. Okay, so let's turn to measurement, right? We're gonna calculate the shift share delta comp for the United States and 24 other countries. So there's an implementation question um, uh, because there's a normalization involved uh, in what I've talked about so far. We're gonna normalize labor supply so that the population share weighted sum of the H's is one. That normalizes effective labor supply to be equal to population in the base year. And therefore, AJ0 is just average wealth of individuals of HJ normalized by GDP per capita. So that's a simple empirical object. Now, how do we measure the H's? Well, with a simple assumption on the production function that all the age groups are perfect substitutes, we can measure relative H's from relative labor income. And so the implementation is then just take the age profile of labor income, normalize it so that uh, th this normalization holds, um, and uh, we have our measure of H's, right? So concretely, we're gonna take data uh, on pies uh, using demographic projections by age. So this is going to be using uh, UN World Population Prospects as well as very meticulous work by Etienne Gagnon uh, and co-authors um, that have broken down the movements in demographic projections into contributions from fertility, uh, mortality, and migration. Um, and then we'll take the age, wealth, and labor income profiles uh, in a base year uh, from a series of surveys. Uh, so our um, our base surveys are going to be for the US, uh, the SCF, and the, and the CPS, uh, as proxied by um, um, this uh, Luxembourg income study. Um, and then, um, and, and, uh, and we'll use a host of other surveys uh, to, to compute um, those age profiles uh, in other countries, including China and India. Okay, so let me turn straight to the results. Uh, so we have a certain forecast uh, for the evolution of the wealth to GDP ratio just due to compositional effects in the United States. And this is what uh, this forecast is. So starting in 2016, which is today, if I'm forecasting the evolution of the wealth to GDP ratio just due to compositional effects, I get by the end of the 21st century, a number like 120. So this says the wealth to GDP ratio will increase uh, from its current level of about uh, 4.5 uh, to uh, 5.7, okay? now. This is, a, this is a, a forecast that you can also run backwards. So you can say, if I held the wealth profiles and the income profiles constant today, uh, how much would I get using the old age distribution? Um, and you get about the entire rise uh, in the wealth to GDP ratio documented by Thomas Piketty and co-authors. So what this shows you is, of course, you don't get all of the effects. We're not saying that demographics is the only thing that's going on or even um, that this is the right way to think about demographics in a world where interest rates are adjusting. This is just suggestive uh, that this compositional effects can be really, really large. Right? Now, let me talk about why they're so large. Right? We're, I'm gonna study separately the effect on W and then the effect on Y. So the numerator first and then the denominator. And I'll separate into the respective contributions to our overall shift chair uh, by using a simple additive decomposition, which is a first order decomposition. Okay, so let's see, let's think about how the, our numerator is constructed. So the numerator takes the age profiles of assets uh, in a base year. Um, and so this is uh, what you get from uh, the SCF in 2016. Um, so the age profile has this shape uh, that is well known from people who study these, these issues, um, that it doesn't rise very much until age 40 and then starts rising dramatically and doesn't tail off until really late in age. So when you overlay that, and, and note in particular that the 70-year-olds hold something like four times as much 
assets as the 40 year olds. So when you overlay that with the age distribution of the population in 1960, uh, there you see that you had a ton of young uh, individuals uh, that were just born from the baby boom um, that held, according to this calculation, zero assets. Uh, and those agents are going to uh, um, age um, in order uh, to, and, and the, the effect will be to push up on, on wealth a lot uh, over time. And so you see uh, in these graphs, the wealth, the age distribution uh, pushing into the asset profile. And we're getting increasingly more first 40 year olds and then 70 year olds that have more and more assets. Uh, uh, and the effect overall is then as the population distribution settles towards its stationary uh, population projection uh, for the end of the 21st century, uh, we're getting an, an increasing effect throughout. Right? So this calculation here just shows you the contribution of the numerator to our overall shift share. Right? And that's an effect that has been historically very large because of the baby boomers and that is projected to keep rising uh, because there is very little decumulation in old ages. Right? And, uh, and we're still really far uh, from uh, what we're seeing as a decline in uh, assets at old ages. So by contrast, labor income also has a, a characteristic hump shape, but this hump shape peaks a lot earlier. And so here, the effects of the baby boomers are actually uh, more subtle. You know, initially, uh, the baby boomers entering the workforce are pushing up on uh, GDP via their effect on effective labor supply. Right? And so this effect that's been talked about a lot in the literature and, and referred to as the demographic dividend, uh, what, what, you, what you see is that by 2010, uh, the, this effect mostly fades. And going forward, the population age distribution is moving uh, away uh, from the peak of the life cycle labor income profile, and that's pushing down on GDP. So this is what this graph summarizes. So starting in the 1970s, the baby boomers have pushed up on overall uh, effective uh, labor supply, and that's the effect of the demographic dividend. Um, and if it had only been for this effect, the wealth to GDP ratio would have fallen. But today we're at the peak of this effect and going forward as the baby boomers are retiring, um, that's going to push down on effective labor supply and therefore um, up on the wealth to GDP ratio. And this effect is quantitatively significant. It accounts for a third of the overall effect on the wealth to GDP ratio that's predicted by our overall shift share. So in sum, both going forward, both wealth um, and uh, GDP are contributing uh, to the overall rise in wealth to GDP. Um, and, and most of this comes from the exact shape of the wealth profile uh, and the labor income profile relative to where the age distribution is. So we can do the same exercise uh, around the world. Uh, and um, on, uh, in, in the online appendix that I've posted on my webpage, uh, we conduct uh, this exercise in each country and we break this down uh, from the contribution uh, of the a asset profile and the contribution of the labor income profile. And what you see when you do this exercise is that around the world, in every country that we have data for, the compositional effect of aging for the 21st century is positive. It's positive and large. And, and the reason is because all countries tend to have similarly shaped age profiles and income profiles. And in particular, they have this characteristic that age profiles do not decline too fast, uh, whereas income profiles decline a lot faster in age. Um, and so that interacts with the population distribution in all of these countries um, in order to get an increase in the wealth to GDP ratio. On the other hand, we also see that these effects are very heterogeneous. And so here is a representation of this. So if you were looking at the end of the 21st century, so by 2100, uh, and the number for the United States is 127, then we're getting some countries like Japan and Germany uh, where the numbers are lower, they're significantly lower, and that's because the aging transition in those countries is mostly over. And then we're getting countries on the other extreme uh, where the aging transition is still way, has still ways to go, uh, like China and India, and those countries have enormous upward pressure on their wealth to GDP ratio uh, from aging. Right? So this shows you the entire magnitude of the heterogeneity. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what's important to note here is that it's mostly the timing of the aging transition, although there is, of course, a contribution also from country-specific age profiles. Um, but um, if, you break, if you do this exercise holding uh, age profiles at the fixed values for the United States, uh, 
uh, you find uh, something that's very similar. Uh, and we document that in the paper. OK, so let me turn uh, to why this exercise that I just conducted, which shows you really large numbers, can be useful for general equilibrium forecasting exercises. So I'm going to turn to a model. Uh, this is going to be a standard multi-country general equilibrium overlapping generations models featuring idiosyncratic income risk, intergenerational transmission of skills, bequests, and a social security system. Uh, so if you want an example from the literature of a state-of-the-art paper that does this, uh, you can think of Kruger and Ludwig uh, and many papers that follow. So in this economy, we have final output produced out of capital and effective labor, uh, where Z, the term Z here, is exogenous labor augmenting technology. And this is a term that uh, has trend growth uh, that's exogenous. Uh, we have perfect competition and free capital adjustment, uh, which gives us the familiar first order conditions from producers uh, equating the, the cost of factors to uh, their marginal products. Um, and we have a labor market clearing condition that says that total efficiency units of labor L here uh, must be the sum of efficiency units of labor um, provided by each of the population of uh, the members of the population, and there's NJ of them at time t. Here is the specification for the savings choice. And that's where all of the complexity of the model lies. Right? So we have heterogeneous households um, that uh, go through a life cycle. And we denote by J their age. Uh, so those households are born at some age zero. Uh, they start work and having children at some age T work. Uh, they'll retire around age TR. And I'm going to show you the specification of retirement in a second. It'll, uh, retirement will be phased in over time. Um, and then they'll die for certain at age T. So their income is the product of four uh, terms. Uh, w is the wage per efficient uh, units of labor supply. Rho is the fraction of agents that are still working at age J. So this is a factor that's controlled by uh, the government uh, that uh, decides uh, the fraction of agents that can work uh, in, a, in a given age. Other agents retire and they get a social security pension. Um, H tilde is the exogenous age efficiency profile in the economy. And then L is a stochastic labor supply shifter that uh, captures the idiosyncratic risk that individuals are facing, as well as potentially permanent risk, uh, i.e. Um, uh, permanent fixed effects uh, that can have some correlation across generations. So our uh, given household born at time K solves a utility maximization problem uh, where um, uh, let me highlight a couple of features of that problem. Um, so this agent is choosing consumption and assets over time um, in order to smooth consumption. Um, but uh, there is a certain term psi j that is a utility modifier uh, that can be traced back to the presence of children in the household. Uh, so uh, when you have children in your household, it makes you starve at a given point in time and ends up uh, uh, increasing your consumption. Um, in addition, they have a certain bequest motive, right? So they're going to smooth in order uh, to, they're going to save in order to smooth income fluctuations, uh, but also uh, for bequest uh, reasons. And the v, t, v term here captures non homotheticities in bequest. It's indexed by T uh, because even though there could be non homotheticities in a cross section, uh, we want to have uh, balanced growth over time. Uh, and so this term uh, just includes a correction for the presence of growth. Um, and then agents are facing mortality risk. Uh, and the, the fees here are capturing the survival rates of cohorts. Uh, and so agents understand uh, the survival uh, probabilities that they're facing at each uh, age. Um, so here are the constraints. So those agents are saving, uh, subject to a certain borrowing constraint. Um, and, um, and, and so their income is uh, determined by stochastic uh, labor income. Uh, uh, and so they're going to save in order to smooth fluctuations in those uh, in, in, in this idiosyncratic income risk. Um, they're receiving transfers from the government. Uh, and those uh, in calibrations will mostly be social security transfers. They could also be unemployment insurance transfers. Um, and they're receiving bequests uh, from uh, their parents uh, that are saving uh, uh, in order to give bequests. Um, and, um, and that's, in, in a nutshell, the, the problem of our households. And so the government here has five instruments um, that it can adjust. Uh, as the economy is aging, uh, of course, the, um, uh, the, there's going to be pressure on public finances uh, because there's more and more retirees. If the government 
has a transfer system uh, where it's paying out social security pensions uh, as the economy ages, and there's a very large literature that talks about this, um, there's a pressure on the, on the social security system, and you can adjust by either raising the retirement age, uh, which is proxied by the row here, uh, you can adjust by raising taxes on income, uh, or you could adjust by uh, cutting social security pensions, or, uh, or you can adjust by lowering government spending. Um, in the short run, you can also, of course, just borrow uh, uh, and uh, kick the problem down the road. Um, so our government is going to have a certain fiscal rule where it's going to use some of these instruments. Um, and we're, we're going to consider various fiscal rules uh, and think about the effect that those rules have on behavioral effects of aging. Okay, so let me uh, highlight features of the asset market clearing in this model. Right? So um, the model features a certain asset market clearing condition that says um, at every point in time, the total wealth uh, that um, households want to invest in this economy, and so that's captured by the uh, overall household wealth uh, that's generated by the problem uh, that I just talked about, as well as net migrant wealth, uh, which is the wealth coming in from migrants, so to the extent that migrants are bringing in their wealth. And in a baseline scenario, we're going to uh, assume that the distribution of assets and income of migrants is the same as the overall distribution in the population. That's just for a baseline. And then we're going to think about what happens if migrants have, say, more assets or less assets uh, or come in uh, uh, younger with uh, uh, more income and so on. Um, and so the, the total demand for assets, uh, which is generated by both households and migrants, uh, is equal to the total supply of assets, uh, which is here, the capital stock, um, domestic government bonds, and then any excess will be saved abroad. And so NFA here denotes the net foreign asset position. So we can have two notions of equilibrium in this model. Um, let me uh, first denote W as total wealth coming from both households and migrants, and then AS as the supply of assets that's domestic, right? So that NFA is the remainder of the supply of assets. So in a small point economy, we'll have exogenous interest rates, and then the NFA will just be determined by the pressure of savings uh, relative to asset supply. Um, and uh, on the other hand, in the world economy, the interest rate must adjust in order to ensure that the NFA on average across countries is zero at every point in time. Now let's think about this steady state asset market clearing condition because that's going to help us uh, understand uh, what's coming for the rest of the paper. So let's divide the asset market clearing condition that I just showed you by output and then con consider a steady state for a given country. In this steady state, I'm going to let theta index demographic parameters. And so I rewrite the NFA divided by output as uh, the difference between wealth over GDP and asset supply over GDP. Now here's an observation. At unchanged B over Y, the ratio of asset supply to GDP is independent of demographics. So this is an important observation uh, because it means uh, that the pressure on the wealth to GDP ratio, so once appropriately normalized by GDP, uh, is the pressure on net asset demand uh, or on uh, the net foreign asset position divided by GDP. So why is this useful? Because then we can consider a change between two steady states. And here I'm talking about steady states um, because it brings a lot of intuitions. Uh, the intuitions that I'm talking about carry over to the transitions that, I'm, that we're computing in the paper. So a change between two steady states uh, will imply a certain change in the NFA divided by Y as the sum of the compositional effect that I talked about and computed so far in the data, an effect that comes from the rest of the change in W over Y when demographics are changing. I'm going to call this the behavioral effect given interest rates. So this is anything uh, that at constant interest rates will imply demographics might increase uh, wealth to GDP. And then there's terms that have to do with interest adjustment. So as interest rates are falling, agents are potentially responding by lowering their desired wealth accumulation, pushing down on wealth to GDP. And uh, producers might be responding by increasing capital, uh, which is pushing up on uh, assets of land. Right. So here we have interest sensitivities that come in uh, to this formula. Why is this useful? Because it shows us how uh, the world interest rate is being determined in equilibrium. So if we're now using bars to denote averages across countries, so we have 
delta bar come for the compositional effect average across countries and delta behavioral given R at a bar, which is the average behavioral effect, then taking this total measure of pressure on net asset demand and dividing by elasticities gives us uh, the overall uh, interest rate effect. So the total small open economy effect, the effect holding interest rates constant is quantifying a certain net asset demand shift. It's quantifying the magnitude of the shift uh, induced by demographics on total asset demand. And in order to understand the effect on equilibrium interest rates, uh, we need to take this measure and divide by the sum of uh, the sensitivity to interest rates of asset demand and asset supply. Now, this sensitivity is typically positive. So because I've computed such a large positive composition effect, and because I'm about to show you that the behavioral effect given R is not very large uh, and can be negligible to a first order, uh, then this tells us uh, that unambiguously, as the economy is aging, interest rates will be falling. Right. Um, more broadly, then it tells us that the overall net asset demand shift is a key determinant, uh, not only of equilibrium interest rates, but also of equilibrium net foreign asset positions, as well as net foreign uh, equilibrium wealth to GDP ratios. Okay, so this tells, this explains why I'm gonna conduct a small open economy exercise first. I'm gonna assume that interest rates are constant uh, that's, that's my way of computing the total shift in net asset demand, which is the numerator here. Uh, and then I'll uh, think about integrated world economy in the second step. Okay, so here is um, the analysis of the small open economy. So here we have a sharp result. Let's consider this small open economy where the interest rate is a constant and assume further, make four further assumptions. So those assumptions are going to be stark, but we're going to get a stark result at the end. The first is that there's a constant efficiency profile of labor and that there's constant TFP growth. Second, we'll assume there's constant mortality profiles. Uh, so agents face the same mortality risk at each age, even as the economy ages. There's constant valuation of children's consumption and the government follows certain tax and transfers policies uh, that are constant over time uh, in a normalized sense. So the tax rates and say the retirement age are constant over time. So these of course are stock assumptions, but under these assumptions, we can prove that there is an equilibrium where the asset distribution of agents is just scaled uh, by productivity over time. So it's unchanged over time once you normalize it by productivity. And so this is a result of balanced growth by age. It tells you that under this set of assumptions, the economy uh, over time will just look like the scaled version of, of, each, of, of itself when you're looking at each individual age. However, we're allowing here uh, for changes in the age structure of the population. For example, structure, age structure of the population that's due to changes in fertility. And so while the behavior of agents is independent of demographic developments, the overall wealth to GDP ratio is changing according to the formula that I showed you at the very beginning where here it is legitimate to hold the age profiles uh, of assets and labor income constant. Okay, so this result in this, is in the spirit of sufficient statistics. Right? In this case, it, it is actually an exact sufficient statistic. So AJ0, which is the average age profile of assets at a given age is all we need to know about age and savings motives in this model in order to compute the wealth to GDP ratio. So it is irrelevant whether say growth loads on time versus cohort effects, what exact type of savings motive there is in the model. So it could be because uh, saving agents are saving because of bequest motives, or it could be because of precautionary savings against income risk, or it could be for pure life cycle reasons. None of this is relevant conditional on the age profile. Similarly, the exact timing of government spending adjustments. So here note, I've assumed that the government adjusts on the government spending margin because the, the other margins are fixed. The exact timing is irrelevant. Uh, and within the class of uh, changes that we're allowing, the exact nature of demographic change is also irrelevant, conditional on the bias. Okay, so this establishes a benchmark. Now, of course, it's a very stark benchmark. It's a special case where I've which I've constructed to show you why it was natural uh, to start evaluating transitions using the compositional effect. And that's because in this case, the behavioral effects given interest rates are exactly zero at all times. 
Now, in the small open economy, our full model has five forces for non-behavioral effects. Uh, and those are forces that people often talk about when they're thinking about demographic change. Uh, so one is the labor supply effect, right? So as the economy ages, either because the, the government is pushing out the retirement age or agents are endogenously choosing to retire later or uh, health improvements make agent more productive late in life, uh, we'll have changing uh, age tilde profiles and that will uh, change our conclusions. Um, there's a declining mortality effect. So in the sufficient statistic uh, uh, theorem, I assumed uh, that uh, mortality by age was held constant. So if instead mortality is declining over time, then because agents in this model are insuring uh, uh, against longevity risk, uh, that will tend to lead them to save more. There is a cost of children effect. So remember this Psi J is the UT, UT modifier due to children. Uh, so as uh, the population distribution changes and uh, in particular fertility changes and um, households have fewer um, members of their household uh, and fewer children, uh, this might allow them to save more. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, and this effect will be captured by our term Psi J and its endogenous relation to the number of, of children in the household. There is a bequest dilution effect. This is coming from the fact that agents have a bequest motive here, right? but as the age distribution of the population changes, and in particular, as you have fewer children, um, if you're saving in order to give a certain bequest per child, uh, then the ratio, uh, the changing ratio of givers to be uh, re receivers is altering the total, the overall uh, amount um, that you, uh, sorry, if you're saving in order to uh, give a certain um, amount of bequest per child, uh, then yes, if you have children, fewer children, of course, you need to save less. You know? uh, alternatively, if you're saving to give a total amount to your children, then that amount can be divided by fewer children. Um, and therefore, that, al that also al alters the overall amount of starting assets that agents have. And finally, there is the well talked about social security balance effects. Right? So as uh, the government uh, is adjusting on margins that are non-government spending, uh, so um, retirement age, social security transfers, or taxes, uh, that's going to alter agents' life cycle income profiles, and therefore uh, it's going to uh, change their savings motives. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use our model to quantify the magnitude of these behavioral effects for given interest rates. Right? Uh, so we're going, to we're going to relax our initial assumptions um, uh, that I made for the sufficient statistic result, and then I'm going to show you how to quantify each of these effects in the context of a calibrated version of the model. Right. So here's our calibration. It's a calibration to the United States as just a laboratory. Uh, and then we're going to redo calibrations for other countries. So we'll externally calibrate a parameter such that the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, the income process, uh, the production side of the model, social security, um, and demographics. And there, very importantly, uh, at least relative to the literature, um, we're going to start from the observed 2016 age distribution. Uh, so this is non-trivial to do because typical uh, models in this literature start from a steady state, but in 2016, the distribution of uh, ages is very far from stationary. And so uh, we're, we're creating a pseudo steady state in which migration comes in to compensate uh, for the fact uh, that, um, that at constant mortality profiles and natality profiles, uh, you would have a changing age distribution. We're going to estimate parameters to fit uh, life cycle profiles. Uh, we'll estimate the discount factor, preferences uh, for bequests, and the weight and exponent on altruism towards children, uh, which governs the relationship between the number of children in your household and the size. And our targets are going to be Number first, and motivated um, by the, uh, the exercise that I've done so far, we're going to target directly the shift chair, right? And so this is just taking seriously this observation that this compositional effect is a very important moment to discipline these models. So we're going to throw it in as a target uh, for our calibration. We're not going to target the age profile of assets otherwise. We'll just target this number. Uh, we'll target the age uh, consumption profile. A Lawrence curve for bequest uh, and the ratio of bequest to GDP, uh, as well as the overall level of wealth. So here is uh, our uh, calibrated parameters. Um, so the, the, the calibration here is mostly standard. 
Um, and let me you know, skip it in the interest of time and we can come back to it uh, if uh, there's questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, here are our fitted H profiles. So as I said, we're not fitting directly the H profile of assets, but we're fitting the shift chair and that provides a fairly good fit to the H profile um, uh, of assets in the SCF. Remember that for us, the main thing that matters is that we're hitting the compositional effect of aging. Uh, and so that's ensured by the fact that we have the correct age distribution in 2016, as well as uh, something that looks like uh, the asset distribution uh, in 2016. Um, Okay, and so um, from here, I'm going to compute uh, transition dynamics in my model. So this is the model, uh, the small open economy model. Right? So this is kind of taking the stark assumption that the United States is on its own in the world economy and it's too small to affect world interest rates. Um, and when it's aging, uh, it's not affecting world interest rates. Right? Now, of course, this is an assumption that needs to be revisited uh, and that's going to be the subject of the last part of the talk. So on the dashed line here, I've plotted the compositional effects. So this is just a measure straight from the data. This is my shift chair measure. And then in the orange line here, I'm computing uh, the transition in the wealth to GDP ratio in my sufficient statistics scenario. So the sufficient statistics scenario makes a bunch of assumptions on the model so that the sufficient statistic theorem holds. So by construction, uh, we're getting a transition dynamic that looks a lot like uh, the data. Of course, it's not exactly the data uh, because I'm not exactly hitting the age profile. I'm just uh, hitting the age profile in some sense, in some, some average sense. Right? By construction, of course, here I'm hitting the last point on the other hand. So from here on, I'm going to be turning on the various forces that I've talked about that are forces that are related to aging at constant interest rates. So the first one I talked about is this bequest force. Um, uh, so the fact that agents in this model uh, are saving in order to target a total amount of bequests that they give. So as uh, there's fewer uh, children, um, children are getting more assets to start with. And so that allows them to save more. Uh, I'm also turning on uh, the uh, marginal utility effect coming from the fact that you have fewer children in the household. Uh, and so your ch children in the household allows you to save more. But the overall combined effect of these two only moves you uh, from the sufficient statistics scenario to just a little bit more. So instead of 125% of GDP, you get 150%. So it's a small behavior all the time. Now, let me turn on in addition, the effect coming from mortality. So this is saying now agents are perceiving uh, the fact that they are, they, are, they are facing lower mortality risk over time and they need to self-insure against this longevity risk. So what's the overall behavioral effect on savings coming from uh, mortality? Well, that's given uh, uh, by the difference um, uh, between the green line and the orange line. And so again, as you see, this behavioral effect, it's not completely negligible, of course, but it's small relative to the compositional effect. So most of the work that's being done on the wealth to GDP ratio, again, comes uh, from the compositional effect that I've computed. Now, these are forces that are pushing up on wealth over time. But of course, there's also forces that push down on wealth. And a major one is the adjustment of social security. So the, in, in our model, the government's adjusting on multiple margins, uh, including uh, raising taxes during your lifetime. And higher taxes during your lifetime um, make you save less. Uh, and as a result, in the baseline, where we turn on a mix of all adjustments, uh, we're actually getting an effect on overall what to GDP ratio at the end of the 21st century that's extremely close uh, to our sufficient statistics scenario. Now, this is not to say that social security adjustments are unimportant uh, for savings. Right? And so this is just an illustration of how large the results could plausibly be if we loaded all adjustments on either cuts of social security benefits, which will lead agents to save a lot more. And this uh, effect is given to you by the green line. Or instead, on raising the retirement age by a, a very large margin and making very optimistic assumptions about how a productive 80-year-olds uh, can be. Uh, and, and that's this late retirement scenario, uh, where instead of uh, bringing in more agents into the workforce that are more productive uh, will mitigate the rise in the wealth to GDP ratio. But what you see again is that the magnitudes that we're talking about here, even in those extreme scenarios, are um, not 
out of line with the initial effect coming from the pure compositional effect, right? So the compositional effect, even in extreme scenarios, provides a very good approximation to the overall effect on the wealth to GDP ratio coming from aging. Um, and this is just another example where instead of uh, doing a mix of adjustments, I've loaded everything on higher income taxes. Okay, so this shows you that if you're in a small open economy and you want to forecast the wealth to GDP ratio, so holding interest rates constant, the compositional effect that I've computed uh, at the beginning of my talk is actually an extremely good approximation to the effect on the wealth to GDP ratio. Now, one thing that I've also shown you is that all economies are undergoing an aging process. And so all economies uh, are saving more. And so at some level, this must be putting downward pressure on interest rates. And this is why it's important to uh, consider uh, the, the model uh, uh, of the integrated world economy. So this is what I'm doing now. I'm going to solve for the integrated world equilibrium. So I'll take 12 countries within my sample of 25 countries that are at least 1% of GDP among those 25. And I'm going to recalibrate the model um, using my US calibration and then tweaking it in order to fit uh, certain uh, aspects of each of these countries. Now, this is not fitting every single uh, idiosyncratic aspect of the countries. Um, but it's fitting the high level uh, aspects uh, that we're interested in. Uh, so we're fitting demographics by country. Uh, we're adjusting social security system parameters uh, in order to ensure government budget balance. Uh, we're uh, adjusting the discount rate and the bequest factors in order to hit simultaneously the wealth to GDP ratios in each country uh, as taken from the data, as well as the compositional effect by country uh, that I've computed in my empirical section. So this, again, takes my proposition seriously that compositional effects are very important moments for these models. And so we need to use them directly as targets for calibration. And then we'll adjust technology uh, in order to uh, make sure that the capital share, uh, um, uh, so the capital output ratio uh, is uh, in line with the data as observed by empirical NFAs. So the capital output ratio bridges the gap between the, in the difference between the wealth to GDP ratio uh, as observed uh, and the empirical NFAs as observed. On the other hand, we do not want to take a stance at this stage on uh, two very important parameters. Um, and instead we're going to vary them within a range that's allowed from the literature. And this is because none of these parameters are identified from uh, the cross section. Uh, uh, so in particular, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution uh, can be adjusted in the model uh, to be relatively large or relatively low without seriously deteriorating the fit of H profiles. Uh, and so we're going to take um, uh, the values of elasticity of intertemporal substitution as reasonable from the literature. We have in the paper a validation exercise where we're looking at a wealth tax experiment and how much that increased wealth as a way to uh, uh, suggest that an elasticity of intertemporal substitution around one is reasonable for these purposes. Uh, but we don't want to take uh, too strong of a stance. And similarly, we don't want to take too strong of a stance on the elasticity of capital labor substitution. And so I'm going to show you various results that uh, vary those parameters. So the first one uh, we're going to look at is the effect on the world interest rate induced by this global aging of the population. Okay, so I'm now conducting a demographic transition where each country is aging according to um, the projections uh, from the data uh, and looking at the effect on the world interest rate in the baseline. Uh, so this suggests that uh, world interest rates uh, might be falling by the end of the 21st century by 80 basis points. Now, we know why this is uh, happening uh, from the simple steady state intuition that I gave you. Uh, there is big pushes around the world uh, on total net asset demand coming from the compositional effect and behavioral effects are not very big compared to compositional effects. So they in no way offset them. Now, remember, however, that this formula for the change in interest rates involved in the denominator, the sum of elasticities or sensitivities uh, of um, asset demand and supply to interest rates. And our baseline scenario just assumes um, certain deep parameters that translate into certain interest rate sensitivities. But 
it is very easy uh, to change those sensitivities, say, by changing the elasticity of capital labor substitution. And so here you see that there is some uncertainty as to what the interest rate effect is. Uh, and especially if we change within a range uh, that's allowed by the literature, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Right? And so depending on the assumptions we make uh, that are reasonable, so say we vary the elasticity of intertemporal substitution from 0.5 to 2, we might get as low as 40 basis points of the falling interest rate or as large as 120 basis points. So it is very difficult with this kind of exercise to precisely give you a magnitude for the overall uh, world change in interest rates. Similarly, it is very difficult to give you a precise magnitude uh, for the world change in world wealth. Um, and therefore, a precise magnitude for the overall increase in wealth to GDP ratio in each country. Because while the behavioral effects at constant interest rates are not very large, in this model, as interest rates are falling, depending in particular on the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, agents might be responding by lowering overall wealth accumulation. Right? And see if the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is very large, as it is um, uh, in the dash green line here, uh, this effect really mitigates the overall increase in the wealth to GDP ratio. So if you're looking at these results, you might say, OK, so qualitatively, you can sign this, uh, but it's very difficult uh, to quantitatively pin down magnitudes. However, let's look at the change in the net foreign asset position. Uh, and here, because the overall net foreign asset position uh, must be zero at every point in time, I'm going to just look at fast aging countries. Right? So I'm going to group countries into fast aging and slow aging uh, based on the median. And then I'm going to look at uh, the change in NFA for the fast aging countries for the range of scenarios. And so here, what you see is that our predictions are much tighter. And also that the change of in NFA over Y is really large. So why are our predictions tighter? Let's go back to my steady state formula. This said, the NFA uh, uh, divided by the change in NFA uh, to GDP is uh, the sum of the compositional effect, the behavioral effect given interest rates, and uh, effects that have to do with interest rates. However, the average NFA must be zero around the world, both at the beginning and the end. And therefore, I can also rewrite this as the sum of two terms. One is a term that says, what's the deviation of the pressure on net asset demand relative to average? And one is a term that has to do with sensitivities of demand and supply to interest rates, net of average sensitivities. Right? And so what matters here is not the overall level of elasticities or sensitivities. It is their cross-country variation. And here is a summary of the argument for why we can do very accurate predictions for global imbalances uh, in this model. The first one is that we've documented those compositional effects to be large and heterogeneous across countries. That was my first section. The second is I've shown you in a small open economy, the behavioral effect at constant interest rates is in fact small. And finally, while sigma and eta, which we're assuming as is common in macro to be common across countries, do affect the level of the, of the interest sensitivities in this formula, they do not affect their differences across countries. And therefore, this suggests that a very good approximation to the change in the NFA to GDP in an integrated world equilibrium is the difference between the composition effect for each country and the average composition effect. This is a purely empirical object. So let me do this uh, uh, in my model. So in my model, I'm gonna look at the composition effect uh, and then look at the effect that this has on NFA to GDPs uh, at the end of the 21st century. Uh, plot this against the 45 degree lines. There is a number of approximations that I've just done here, which means that this doesn't hold exactly, uh, but this shows you that this provides a very good fit. Now, let me look historically. If I sit in 1970 and do this exercise, and then I look at the change in the NFA between 1970 and 2011, how well has this performed? This graph shows you, well, it has actually not performed that poorly. And that might almost be surprising in the light of the fact that, of course, there's been lots of other developments that have changed uh, NFAs, including increasing global financial development. Um, but for example, a data point that's comforting is the fact that Japan has the largest shift share effect, um, and it also um, uh, has accumulated the largest NFA. So in conclusion, here is my uh, forecasting exercise. And this is essentially uh, a bit tongue in cheek in that, of course, 
I know that there's lots of other things that have driven NFAs in the past, but this shows you the magnitudes. Going forward, I'm going to predict NFAs using just my empirical shift chair net of the average shift chair. And these are the effect on global imbalances that I'm projecting. So what you see is that the differential timing of aging across countries is generating enormous pressure on NFAs and is projecting to increase very significantly NFAs going up. So to conclude, how does population aging affect wealth to output ratios, real interest rates and capital flows? We can use the compositional effect as a starting point for forecasts. These compositional effects are large and heterogeneous in the data. Going forward, our approach suggests that demographics will cause real interest rates to fall, but the magnitude is uncertain. Wealth to GDP ratios to rise, though the effects are going to be attenuated by the falling interest rates and the magnitude is uncertain. But we're more certain about the effects on global imbalances and we think that they're substantially going to increase from today's levels, right? So in one word, the global savings glut has just begun. Okay, so that ends my presentation and I'm very happy to take questions now. Okay, well, great, Adrian. Thanks so much uh, for the talk. Uh, so now everyone in the audience, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, the, what you need to do is essentially you need to raise your hand. So in case you're not familiar with Zoom by now, uh, if you click on the participant button, uh, then that will give you the option to, to raise your hand, in which case I can call on you to uh, ask a question. So don't be shy uh, if uh, there's something that you would like to know or ask about from for now. I think that, uh, Morton, do you want to start off by asking a question that you had said that you might have while mm -hmm. we see if there's anyone in the yeah. audience that would like to No, so no, a very, very interesting paper. Uh, uh, so one thing I was wondering about uh, in terms of um, in terms of what is going on is whether this uh, the age profile and in income, whether we should expect that perhaps to be changing. I'm just okay. thinking. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking that, uh, I mean, I, I guess it's something we see already that um, that the older participants in labor market, they, they are the old, right. old people, they keep on participating for a long time, which may suggest That's that right. productivity remains high. Right, so the labor force participation literature, for example, has pointed out that uh, there is an effect that comes on labor force participation rates that come just from aging. Um, but there's also an effect uh, that is due to the fact that labor force participation tends to increase at higher ages. And, um, and so we are proxying for this effect in our model um, by uh, this exercise where we're changing the retirement age uh, and we're making very optimistic assumptions on how, uh, how productive old agents are. Right? Right. So, this, and so when we're pushing it to 80, that, that's essentially just saying, suppose that agents remain very productive as productive as 60 year olds until they're 80. Right, uh, and so that that is an effect that we think is very important in practice. Um, and um, the now the overall document effect that we document in in the paper uh, on the wealth to GDP ratio is not trivial, but it is certainly not enough to undo the compositional effect. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, let me just say that there's two kind of interesting canceling forces there. So as people become healthier and they they die later, that'll tend to increase their their wealth. Their, their life cycle savings because they need to save for, for when they get older. Um, yeah. And so Adrian showed that. On the other hand, uh, as, as they're healthier and can work longer and the retirement age goes later, that tends to decrease their savings. And as we, we found that those kind of cancel out under reasonable assumptions, um, you can sort of see their, their, their opposite forces. Okay, uh, again, people in the audience, don't be shy, uh, but Claudia had a question, so we'll, we'll go to her and then. Don't forget to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question from the audience. Great, thank you. And thank you, this is a really interesting paper and I love all the distributional, thinking about what's what's driving the wealth to income ratio. Oh, and before I get like rambling on, I will um, emphasize Kurt's point. There were some really great questions in the Q&A and I know they were answered, but hey, ask them again for the group so that Adrian and they can join in on the answers. And I mean, seriously, as organizers were watching and there's no hands up, so get some hands up, please. Um, okay, so a little bit of wind up. I, so I wanna think, I wanna ask you to think a little bigger. I mean, you've talked a lot about what's happening with the wealth to income ratio. And I love that you looked at it, not just in the US context, but across the globe, which I think is an important piece of it. Um, so, but what does this mean, right? Like, 
one of the and his context for the question and to make it a little more just like narrow than like what does this mean um is one of the things that when i was working on the consumption forecast at the the federal reserve board kind of years into the recovery one of the things that we noticed was that like consumer spending really wasn't picking up like we would have expected to. Like the stock market had really picked up. We saw wealth to income ratios move back up um, in ways that, I mean, they were hitting historical peaks and we're like relative to the relationship that we've seen historically and it's just an empirical thing, right? Of consumption, wealth and income we would have expected more consumer spending. And my colleagues, Laura Fiveson and Adi Aladangatri at the board, I mean, went through a whole exercise of like, what the hell is going on? And one of the things, and this is very consonant with your research, and that's why I'm so excited to see this, is that it was, they were, they went through demographics, they didn't think that could explain it, but then they went through a lot of other distributional effects, whether in like inequality, like you know, it gets into MPCs. So I just, I'm curious what you think the wealth to income ratio, what's happened in say the last decade means for economic activity, consumer spending, and then what your projections and kind of how you think about it going forward, both in the US and kind of globally, what that means for economic activity. So, so let me maybe first emphasize one point. I think this is a very interesting question. So one aspect of our sufficient statistic results is that the entire set of distributions by age and, and policies of agents by age are not changing as the economy is aging, right? So one uh, answer to your question, why does rising aggregate wealth to GDP ratio means in this context is, it means strictly nothing for individual agents. Individual agents just keep exactly doing the same thing. And so in particular, their own consumption is unaltered at given ages. And all that's changing is that uh, aggregate consumption might be changing just because we're weighing uh, different agents differently. Right? So that's um, that's one right, aspect. But that was my question is what's happening on aggregate? Like I get it that it's not changing at the individual level. Yeah, so you could conduct a, a shift share on consumption. Uh, and if, if these assumptions hold, the shift share on consumption where you're holding the consumption profile of agent constants uh, would give you the overall effect on, cons on aggregate consumption. Uh, now, one reason why we shy away from doing this in the paper is because we think it's very difficult to accurately measure life cycle profiles of consumption. And so instead we prefer to focus on stocks rather than flows. Um, and so uh, tackle wealth directly rather than consumption. Right? Um, another aspect to your question, I think, is uh, you know why is it that wealth to GDP ratios are falling, um, are, are rising? Sorry, and it, 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 part of it could be due to declining interest rates, and those are known to have ambiguous effects on consumption. So it could go either direction. Um, so I, I think that it is kind of difficult to draw very definitive conclusions from rising wealth to GDP ratios overall uh, for uh, things like uh, aggregate consumption um, because of these different factors. Yeah, no, and I would, you know, it's not like, it's not totally within the scope of your paper, but I mean, this is the bane of the existence of forecasters at the Fed. So, and we look to you all for good advice on how to do this. So I think, you know, if you want to, if you get bored and you want to do some more with this, it would be helpful. So okay, thank yeah, you. That's, but that was a helpful, very helpful answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, Stefania had a question that she wanted to ask you. And again, anyone from the audience, feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, well, great paper and great presentation. Um, I have a question on the role of um, policies, particular tax policies. So wealth taxes have been in the news uh, and in the policy debate a lot to think about you know, reducing inequality, but it seems here that um, you know, it, we could potentially um, use wealth taxes to some degree to reduce these global imbalances and this adverse effect on equilibrium interest rates. So I was thinking, uh, you know, uh, whether you thought about that and whether that could be assessed in the context of the model. And also, you know, the different countries that you look at have different uh, fiscal policies, you know, uh, uh, in terms of labor income taxes and also wealth taxes. And so another question that I had, you know, what's the role of these different uh, fiscal systems in terms of determining the degree to which different countries that are aging, um, you know, may be subject uh, to the mechanisms that you highlight in the model. So 
okay, so I, I let me take this. So, so I think so. Wealth taxes are um, something that we've thought about, uh, not so much as a policy instrument say, to mitigate inequality. So let me first say something about inequality uh, generally, because often the rise of wealth to GDP ratios is associated with the rise of, in income, of inequality. Right? But in in our paper, uh, inequality is largely orthogonal to aging, right? and mm. and so. In particular, what's going on as those wealth to GDP ratios are rising is inequality within age is actually not changing. And, um, and in fact, we've looked at this empirically also. And it, 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 uh, it turns out that um, if you're looking at uh, a decomposition of rising inequality, say rising wealth inequality uh, by within versus between age, uh, you find that um, the, the within age is the most important in the data. Right? So this is not a force that we actually have, right? So the, and, and so, we're seeing rising wealth to GDP ratios, which induce a little bit of an effect on overall inequality, not so I, between age inequality, but that's not a huge effect. Right? And so we're thinking of these uh, as largely separate issues, not to say that rising inequality hasn't been a big issue, uh, but, uh, in, but, but it is possible to think about the rising wealth to GDP without any reference to inequality. So that's the first thing. Just so, to emphasize that we we don't uh, we we definitely don't dismiss inequality explanations. Like Adrian and I have a separate paper about that. Um, but I think what this exercise shows, kind of, or uh, zeroing out the the within age inequality, is that you can still get these big increases in W over Y that a lot of people, like say Piketty, have kind of assumed has to be the result of inequality. And we show that doesn't have to be the case, even though we think some of it probably is. No, but. Sorry. I agree with that, but my point was more, you know, um, usually we think about fiscal policy as something to tackle inequality, and what I was asking for is there, you know, so some room here to use, you know, um, fiscal policy instruments such as the wealth tax, which usually people think about, you know, as, as an instrument to target inequality, to actually target the imbalances that occur as, uh, as a function of the rise of this wealth to income ratio, um, but there are also other policy instruments like different social security systems, May induce different degree of you know wealth accumulation with age, uh, and that could also be you know something that we could use if we want to reduce these kinds of imbalances. So it was I wasn't just trying to sort of say well there's inequality and we want to tackle it and that's going to solve your problem. I was more thinking right. about you know um, uh, using traditionally fiscal traditional fiscal policy you know to sort of tackle some of these imbalances. Yeah, so the so so again, so the goal of this paper is purely just a positive exercise. So we actually haven't done the normative exercise, and and there is extremely interesting and very rich normative implications of these models with incomplete markets that uh, with heterogeneous agents that have not even that are just beginning to emerge. So in some sense, it'd be way too early to give a definitive conclusion here as to what uh, the uh, optimal, say, fiscal policy might be in this model, where there's lots of uh, redistributive motives. Um, but it is certainly the case that a wealth tax uh, in this model um, will um, uh, will mitigate the the rise of, uh, of of aggregate wealth. And and we've actually used this um, in order in this disciplining exercise for the elasticity of intertropical substitution. So we've looked. Uh, a series of experiments uh, around the world where the wealth level of the wealth tax was changed. Uh, and so you can proxy for that. So as a, a, as a change in the real interest rate, um, and then you can look at the effect that this has on wealth accumulation. And as I said in the paper, in this validation exercise, you know, those studies tend to suggest for our model that the LSE substitutions are around one. So there is a relatively substantial effect of uh, the wealth, uh, wealth tax in this model on wealth accumulation that also seems to be uh, consistent with the data. So at least as a positive, uh, as just as a positive analysis, a wealth tax uh, does have a, can have a substantial effect on wealth accumulation in our model. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that this is normatively the right thing to do. And the, the welfare objective is just, just so complex um, that uh, it'd be way too early to say whether this is something you actually want to do. I would also add, actually, Stefania, one thing, which is that I think you identify correctly as well that, you know, there's been a lot of independent interest in W over Y, a lot of it connected to inequality issue. But if you see the sort of line of the argument in this paper, we start from W over Y because it's actually a very good proxy for like net asset demand and so the forces that are moving interest rate that are moving the global imbalances. So I think you're also right to connect that, you know, 
once you take that perspective uh, that you know you start from W over Y, that's a natural starting point to think about all of these issues, uh, both for a small open economy and in an integrated world economy. Certainly, you start to think that you know secular stagnation and these sort of different things definitely interact with all of these questions that people have been bringing up in terms of the, the wealth to income ratio as well. Okay, well, actually, my point was exactly that, that I think, um, you know, when we think about fiscal policy, we don't usually think about these very long run, you know, structural effects uh, of these different policies. And I think the analysis that you do in your paper, you know, points to some, you know, really important channel uh, of effects of, um, for example, wealth taxes and income taxes. So it was more encouraging you to think about that, because I think it's a really, you know, fresh perspective on, on the impact of fiscal policy in that sense. I think the long term point is, is really important because we find surprisingly large elasticities in the long term of wealth accumulation to interest rates or to whatever the kind of post tax rate of return is, um, you know, much larger than you get in kind of a short run analysis or maybe much larger than a lot of people think is reasonable. Um, and, and, you know, we, it looks like from everything we've told, seeing that that force actually makes a lot of sense within the model. So it suggests say that a wealth tax could be pretty powerful at reducing this kind of accumulation problem that we see in the model. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I had a question uh, that I wanted to ask you guys. So this was kind of thinking about, you know, you kind of have, it's more for thinking about, uh, I guess the, the GE part of it, but again, thinking about in terms of asset composition, I mean, we know that a lot of wealth in these countries like the United States is in housing. Um, and so just, and obviously Matt has done, you know, work on kind of thinking about the importance of housing over time for, for wealth. And so just kind of thinking about how, how that would change things, both in terms of kind of what the, the asset Kind of demand that's going to be coming from the supply side would be, uh, but also whether we think that kind of the return, you know, should the return on housing be falling with kind of aggregate housing wealth and just kind of thinking about those issues and also related to the global balances. I mean, that, that's kind of, you know, housing is is the, uh, a home good, not a, you know, it's not tradable. So kind of thinking about how that might change kind of the analysis and the forecast for for going forward. I mean, yeah, certainly housing is a, is a pretty big part of wealth. So in, in the US, in the data we use, say the most recent SCF, um, I think it, we found it was like 28% of net worth. Um, if you look at, say, the flow of funds, um, the most recent series, it's like 25% of household net worth. Now, it's less than that if you used to track mortgages. It's something like 15% or a little more than that of net worth. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty big chunk. And so we agree, you know, it would be a great extension to kind of consider housing explicitly here. Um, it would have some interesting effects. Um, you know, it, it would certainly make the household model more a little bit more complicated. Um, to, to some extent, since we're including, you know, housing in the trajectory of the assets that people accumulate throughout their lives, you know, um, we're, we're, and we're trying to move that behavior, you know, we're already kind of uh, getting the role of housing in people's life cycle accumulation. Um, but on the asset kind of supply side, um, the fact that housing is indeed an asset that is kind of within a country and not away from a country is, um, would change things a little bit, um, you know, since, Old people still need houses, although overall we found actually they need somewhat smaller houses. Um, so it, it might mitigate um, the the kind of fall in the, the total amount of assets in, in rapidly aging countries on the supply side a little bit. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, even if housing is a home good, you can still take a mortgage uh, out on a house and the, and the aggregate, they're pretty large and that can be kind of globally integrated capital markets. Okay, well, thanks. I guess I'll, we'll take one last call from the audience. If there's anyone that's been shy but has a burning question that you'd like to ask, uh, raise your hand now. Um, or if not, then ah, we have a question from Joseph Kopecki, uh, which may be Karen Kopecki, but or is Joseph? Joseph, you're allowed to talk. All right, can you hear me? Uh, not Karen Kopecki. Uh, okay, but, sorry. Uh, <laughs> No relation, at least none that I know of. Uh, so I asked this in the in the chat, but I'm a little bit curious uh, as well, because uh, it seems to me that over time, as more and more countries go into this sort of very old part of the distribution, that things like general equilibrium effects on interest rates might have a particularly outsized effect on the actual shape of the asset accumulation over the life cycle. So Maybe I don't fully understand how this works in your model, but should I be worried that maybe the way in which aging affects, uh, or at least the way in which the partial equilibrium compositional effect shock operates might itself 
be dependent on sort of how big those effects are on that sort of aging relationship. This is kind of similar to what was asked at the very beginning, I suppose. But, uh, so, so again, so the way that we are doing this exercise is we're first saying what would be the compositional effects at constant interest rates? Because uh, mm -hmm. we think we have a firmer grasp on what those effects are. Uh, and then we're saying, uh, well, suppose demographics is all constant, but interest rates are changing. And so you're right, right uh, that um, as interest rates are falling, that's affecting very heterogeneously the asset profile of agents. And in a way that's uh, kind of model dependent and also depends on Certain on various calibrations, say for the elasticity of intercompound substitution. So, the so so we're very explicitly recognizing that the that interest rate changes will have effects on um, aggregate wealth. Right? We're in in our model, it has very heterogeneous effects across, say, the life cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but for the point of view of uh, forecasting aggregate interest rates uh, or aggregate NFAs, this particular heterogeneity in the way in which interest rates affect uh, in, in, affects wealth over the life cycle is not dire directly relevant. Uh, it's not to say that it's in, not interesting or that we couldn't think about validating it. And in fact, in this validation exercise that we've done, uh, looking at wealth taxes, we've looked across uh, the, the, the wealth distribution. So this is, you know, partly um, this is not quite across the age distribution, but across the wealth distribution, we have some validation for the magnitudes of the changes in wealth by, by assets in this case. So, and, and you, you could think about validating that aspect of the model too. Um, but we don't think it is essential uh, for uh, the overall exercise that we're doing or for the, our overall conclusions, but it's not to say that it's not super interesting. Sure, yeah. I guess one of the things I was interested in is, can you sort of decompose how important the like say a composition effect relative to these endogenous changes would be over time. Is that something like an exercise you can do in the model right. or is it uh, something that you can't do because- Yeah, so we can absolutely do in. this. Yeah, so in, in, in we, one exercise that we have in the paper is uh, thinking about the, the history of the evolution of the wealth to GDP ratio since 1960 uh, through the lens of this model. So, um, um, there's been, so, so what we do is we say, well, let's, let's assume that interest rates have fallen uh, in, the, in, you know, in the model as they did in the data over that time period. Uh, let's assume that the economy has aged and also let's assume that uh, productivity, has, productivity growth has fallen uh, in light with what we've seen in the data. So we feed in all of these trends uh, and then we show that um, by feeding in those exogenous trends, we're actually doing a decent job at tracing out the evolution of the wealth to GDP uh, ratio over time. And that's because compositional effects of aging are pushing it up. At the same time, we have an effect from interest rates uh, that's pushing down on wealth accumulation and an effect on uh, from falling productivity growth that's uh, creating big life cycle savings motives and pushing up on overall wealth. So if you want, you have counterbalancing effects from falling interest rates and falling productivity growth um, that helps us uh, rationalize the observed wealth W over Y. Now, in the context of that model, we can then do decompositions where we can try to think about the way in which the asset profiles are changing over time and over age because we have a full structural model. This is not something that we've done there, uh, but this is something that we could in principle do. And if we wanted to validate this exercise more, uh, this is definitely something that we uh, could do, either looking, looking at um, across sectionally the predictions for this, uh, this model fitted to the overall trends. I would also add that actually there's a very simple expression that we have as well for how much general equilibrium forces weaken the compositional effect. And that is that essentially you can think of this as we have a partial equilibrium response at fixed interest rate coming mainly from the compositional effect. The effect on aggregate wealth to output ratio is given essentially by the ratio of how much asset supply adjusts to that too much asset supply and asset demand do it adjust together. So you can think of this as if the response to falling interest rate is that there's a massive increase in capital accumulation and households just stay put, it's going to be a one for one mapping. If the only effect is that households just stop saving and nothing happens to capital, then essentially nothing's going to happen to the wealth to income ratio. That's a steady state approximation, but we show in the paper that actually does a very good job, especially for interest rate, but actually a pretty good job for, for wealth as well, to think about how much general equilibrium forces attenuate the rise in wealth to output ratios uh, from this partial equilibrium. Overall, and in principle, we could um, 
look at a similar formula for thinking about how what's happening at every point in the age distribution or the asset distribution and so on and so forth, right? So uh, the formula that okay. Hans talked about is kind of for the aggregate, uh, but you could also do this uh, more finely across the age distribution or the asset distribution um, and, and Great. get like an age specific attenuation factor from interest rates, which I think is what you're interested in. Nice, thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, next uh, we have Dan Cow that has a question from the audience. Dan, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, hi, thank you, Coach. Uh, uh, hi, Andrew, I'm still good to see you here and thank you for the interesting paper. So, um, so you mentioned related to this question on cross-sectional inequality, right? So we mentioned that the uh, within it, uh, within age, cross-sectional well inequality is relatively constant, right? But the, um, but the age distribution is shifting over time. So in the, I, model, uh, in the model, the model, yeah. So I guess in uh, the model would predict that wealth inequality would, would increase over time as well, right? Because the, the older people have more wealth. Right. But, uh, but I guess that's not one of the things that we want to, uh, to have focus on, right? Because in the data- Well, so the, well we've, we've actually, so what I said was in the model, you can look at the extent to which uh, wealth inequality overall rises. Um, and there is an effect that comes from uh, the between age. Um, right. um, but that effect is not very large, you know, and it's right. not very large in our model. So essentially, if you look at overall measures of in wealth inequality over time, over the evolution of the 21st century in our model, uh, those measures do not rise very much. And that's because the between age component is just nowhere near enough. If you want the, the overall starting level of between age inequality is not very big. Uh, it, it, there is some, uh, but most of the inequality is already within age in the data. And so, you know, we're consistent with between age inequality in, in, as a starting point, uh, but it's not very big. And so as uh, average aggregate wealth to GDP ratio increases, older, um, the, the, the overall effect on inequality is not large. Okay, so it's not big in the model and it's not big in the data either. It's not being in the model. And then historically in the data, if you're computing um, the share of overall rise in wealth inequality that comes from the uh, between age component, uh, that share is small. So it's, it's uh, again, so it's, it just suggests that inequality is somewhat orthogonal to the overall rise in wealth to GDP ratio in that sense, right? Uh, okay. It could be via general equilibrium forces as Matt and I have pointed out in a, another paper um, that um, inequality might be creating falls in interest rates you know, and but it's not um, it's not directly related uh, to the rise in wealth to GDP ratio in that, in that sense. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hang on there. Okay, well, I think that is about where we will wrap up today uh, since we don't seem to have any more questions for the audience and we're just about out of time anyway. Uh, so I just want to say thanks a lot again to Adrian, Matt, Hannes, and Fred for being here. It was really an excellent paper and a great presentation. So we're very happy that you could be here for VMAX. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, next week we have uh, Harold Ulig on Tuesday and Max Croce on Thursday. Uh, so we hope to see you all back then. Uh, but otherwise, everyone have a great weekend and stay safe. And thanks again to our presenters for a great talk. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys, for putting this together. Thanks. Thank you very much.